Welcome. You're watching the third in a series of six short talks entitled In View of the Mercies, a journey through Romans 1 to 11. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, based on the mercies of God, offer yourself fully to him. We can't offer ourselves to a God we don't trust. But when we see God in all his goodness, all his love, all his mercy, the only appropriate response is to offer ourselves fully to him. I want you to become a mercy appreciator. The more you see of God's mercy, the more you will offer yourself to God. In the first session, we looked at Romans 1 and 2 and we're reminded that we can only begin to understand mercy when we understand God's judgment against sin. In the second session, we looked at Romans 3 and considered the mercy of God in the sacrificial death of Christ. Now, two things happened in the death of Christ with respect to sin. The first is the penalty of sin was dealt with. The stain of sin is now removed, we're now forgiven, there is now no condemnation. But the mercy of God extends beyond removing sin's penalty in some afterlife. God's mercy deals with sin's power in the here and now. This is what we're going to look at in this study, with special attention to Romans chapter 6. When you put your trust in Christ, receive the Holy Spirit and become one of God's children, you receive a complete new identity. Once you were in Adam, but now you are in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul describes this as a new, being a new creation. When you're in Adam, you can't help but sin. You're simply living out your identity as a son or daughter of Adam. But when you're in Christ, you're no longer a slave to sin. There's no in-between identity. You can't be partly in Christ. You are simply in Christ. Once in Adam, now in Christ. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at Romans chapters 5 and 6. And I'm going to read to you some key verses. Now, in Romans 5, Paul makes a comparison between being in Adam and being in Christ. Uh, verses 18 and 19. Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Romans 6, 4-7, We were therefore buried with him, that is Christ, through baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Romans 6, 8 to 11. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.17 Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So, in Romans 3, we looked at how Christ died for you. But here, the emphasis is not on what Christ did for you, that is external to you, but on how you did, sorry, on, in how you died with Christ. The emphasis is on identification and participation. Interesting, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're remembering both Christ's sacrifice for us and our participation in him. 
In Romans 5 and 6, Paul is arguing that everything that happened to Christ happened to you. When you were in Adam, everything that happened to Adam happened to you. But now that you were in Christ, everything that happened to Christ happened to you. That's exciting. That's very exciting. In chapter 3, the emphasis is on removal of the penalty of sin. In chapter 6, the emphasis is on removal of the power of sin. When you are in Adam, it's like being on an escalator, going down. Whatever happens to that escalator happens to you without you thinking too much about it. Now that you're in Christ, you've changed escalators, you're going up. It doesn't require great effort on your part. Just get on, trust Christ to do in and through you what you cannot do for yourself. You're in Him. Now, some people might say, but hang on a minute. Doesn't Romans 7 talk about the struggle against sin? and how the good we want to do, we can't do, but the evil we don't want to do, this we keep on doing? Yes, it does say that. And there's a very simple explanation. The picture in Romans 7 is of someone who is still in slavery to sin. They are totally controlled by sin and unable to live righteously. They know the good they ought to do, but they just can't do it. Is this the Christian person indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Well, if that was so, it would be a complete contradiction of what Paul says in Romans 6. Paul is simply in Romans 7 using a literary device, assuming the position of a Jew who's under law, who has no knowledge of Christ or the Spirit, who's conscientiously trying to do good, but no matter how hard they try, they cannot fully live out the righteous demands of the law. Now, this is very important because a lot of people say, well, I can't help the way I speak or act because I'm only human just doing what comes naturally or I'm not perfect you know they say now it sounds humble but it is a denial of our identity as those in Christ now I'm not saying that those in Christ never sin I'm saying those in Christ are no longer a slave to sin you've been set free from it and you've been set free to live a life that pleases God it's not automatic, you still have to choose, but at least now the choice is possible, whereas when you were in Adam, that choice was not possible. And that, my friends, is another of God's mercies. We have been set free from slavery to sin. We have a new master, and that master brings freedom. Righteousness is not just a status conferred as a gift from God. Righteousness is our new master, whom we can't help but want to obey.